Okay, knowing that I was on last or near last at this sort of late hour, I thought I would give my talk a provocative title. So it is Bait and Switch, the Penny Wong Bill, which provides a good case study for understanding the queer activist playbook for attacking religious freedom. Because those who do not learn from history are bound to repeat it. Now, I use the word queer not in the pejorative sense, but because it is increasingly the word that activists are coalescing around as a descriptor for the sexual orientation and gender identity alphabet. When I refer to the Penny Wong Bill, I'm referring to the attempt to remove protections primarily for Christian schools to operate in accordance with the orthodox Christian doctrine. Uh, and those exemptions were in the Federal Sex Discrimination Act. We've already touched on that in a number of talks today. It's a colourful title, and some may wonder whether it will attract a discrimination claim or pejorative comments on the queer activists and the playbook that they use. It's not. My aim is to show you how your opposition organises if you are in favour of religious freedom, a united vision, a long-term strategy, progressive agenda, the control and co-option of language, the co-option of the media, all within a context where Australia is increasingly less tolerant of Christian virtues and truth in the public square. The means of attack is simple, and you've seen some of the cases that other legal practitioners have uh, presented. It starts with individuals. At HRLA, we have a number of active cases, over 20 involving teachers, doctors, counsellors, pharmacists, taxi drivers, all whose religious freedoms are being uh, discriminated against in their employment, in the public service, in various contexts. The next step after individuals will be Christian organisations, schools, associations, sporting clubs, camps, and the last step is the church itself, which voice may be ultimately neutered in Western society. So let's give some context, because the Penny Wong bill arose in a specific context. And that, of course, is the homosexual marriage postal vote that occurred in August through November 2017. We had, of course, a, a postal vote where the majority of Australians who participated voted in favour of homosexual marriage. The passage of the legislation through Parliament attempted to include protections for religious freedoms by inclusion of amendments to the Homosexual Marriage Bill, all of which were voted down. Malcolm Turnbull kicked off uh, those religious freedom concerns to a separate panel chaired by the AG, the former AG Philip Ruddock. So there was the uh, appointment of a panel of uh, five persons, the Ruddock panel, appointed in November 2017. These guys didn't get a Christmas holiday. They were appointed in November, had to report back in February. Uh, sorry, March of 2018. An incredible 15,500 submissions were lodged with the Ruddock panel between December and February, and a report that was completed in May. Given to government, government held on to it for six months and would not release any of that information. There was a perception in government that actively engaging on religious freedom issues was going to be electoral poison, that quiet Australians would be drowned out by the activists and there were no votes in it. But there were media leaks in October 2018. Fairfax journos got a hold of the full report, leaked the recommendations, and almost immediately a furor arose about Christian school protections. The government eventually released the report on 13 December 2018, but not before the Penny Wong bill 
had been introduced. Here's the Religious Freedom Review cover page. So, with the leaking of the Ruddock Report recommendations, there was immediate activist engagement, which I call the bait. What was the problem? What the Ruddock Report proposed was to preserve the rights of Christian schools to operate in accordance with Orthodox Christian teachings. But the media piled in on this. This is discrimination. There was controversy. There was outrage. There were media articles almost immediately from The Guardian and all of the major outlets. One article writer said, let's face it, throwing kids out of school for being gay is disgusting. This is the particular point that they focused on. Not for a long, long time has such an idea been respectable in this country. But in 2018, Philip Ruddock's Religious Freedom Review has kept it on the table. This isn't about freedom, it's cruelty. So ScoMo, the Christian, is all for putting the boot into gay kids. That's useful to know too. But he, that's Morrison, is right. Most states and territories, all but Queensland and Tasmania, let church schools get rid of gay and lesbian kids just for being who they are. Greens MP David Shoebridge said, there has never even been a basic attempt to balance out competing interests of so-called religious freedoms and the right to be free from discrimination. So, the Fuhrer was about expulsion of gay children. The refusal for Christian schools to admit gay children. Now, I, I want anyone in the room to tell me how many examples of so-called gay children being expelled from school were there? Zero. How many cases of gay children not being admitted to a school, to a Christian school, were there? Zero. Zero. This was a perfectly media-confected storm. So in November 2018, before we've even seen the full Ruddock report on religious freedoms, the document that was supposed to address the Christians' concerns about increasing encroachment on their freedoms, we have a bill introduced which does exactly the opposite. Penny Wong, in the Senate, introduces her bill. The discrimination brackets, removing discrimination against students brackets, Bill 2018. Again, reinforcing this idea, it's about discrimination. It's about discrimination against children for simply being who they are. The bill was referred to the Senate Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee for consideration when the Labor Party couldn't push it through urgently before Christmas. It was considered, uh, given a thousand plus submissions over the Christmas break of 2018, 2019. Again, no one got Christmas holidays. In February 2019, there were public hearings in Brisbane and Sydney and then a report that was filed. This bill failed to proceed by the balance of one single vote, and that was the Centre Alliance. It's been kicked to the Australian Human Rights Commission for a report and recommendations on how best to protect gay students uh, in the exemptions in the Sex Discrimination Act. That's where it is right now. So, what's the problem? Ah, here we go. Here's some of the articles. The right to expel gay children from school isn't about freedom, it's about cruelty. David Maher, The Guardian. Gay students could be rejected by religious schools under new laws, the report claims. Religious Freedom Review enshrines rights of schools to turn away gay children and teachers. And there's Penny Wong, angry at the fact that the government wouldn't push through her bill under urgency before Christmas. So let's have a look at the Sex Discrimination Act. This is the fun bit, because I know there's a lot of lawyers in the room, and I suspect the rest of you really wish you were lawyers. So, <laughs> so here's your chance. Let's look at some law. This is the Sex Discrimination Act, 1984. 
you need to understand exactly what's at stake. This law's been around for 35 years. And let's start with the purpose of the law. The purpose is an act relating to discrimination on the ground of sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, intersex status, marital or relationship status, dot, dot, dot. It's got a series of protected attributes that it says no person can discriminate against. And in the context of education, we have this section here, section 21. Can people read this? Well, let me read you the gist of it. It is unlawful for an education authority to discriminate against a person on the grounds of the person's sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, intersex status, dot, 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 A, by refusing or failing to accept the person's application for admission as a student, or B, in the terms or conditions on which it is prepared to admit the student. The second limb, it is unlawful for an education authority to discriminate, again on those protected attributes, by denying the student's access or limiting the student's access to any benefit, B, expelling the student, C, by subjecting the student to any other detriment. That is a broad-based prohibition against discrimination which applies to everybody. How are Christians protected? Well, in 1984, exemptions were placed in the Sex Discrimination Act. There's an exemption, a broad-ranging exemption for religious bodies in Section 37 that says nothing in Division 1 or 2, in other words, nothing that prohibits discrimination, will affect religious bodies. And it goes into particular categories, the one of interest is it doesn't apply to any act or practice of a body established for religious purposes. But you can see already here they've decided to limit the exemption. So in subsection 2, if you are a retirement home that's receiving government money, then you can't take advantage of this exemption. The other place where you get an exemption specifically for educational institutions is in the adjoining section, section 38, which has three limbs. The first one says nothing applies to the employment of employees. The section, second section says nothing applies for the employment of contractors. And the third one is the one that says nothing of this uh, applies. You are exempt from the act where you are involved in the provision of education as a religious institution. And they all follow the same formula. They say, where this is the provision of training by an institution that is conducted in accordance with the doctrines, tenets, beliefs, or teachings of a particular religion or creed, if the first mentioned person so discriminates in good faith in order to avoid injury to the religious susceptibilities of adherence to that religion or creed. This is what I want to talk about, is the red highlighted word in here and here. In 1984, Someone added to the act, necessary to avoid injury to the religious susceptibilities of adherence to that religion. That is outrageous, and it's been in the act for 35 years. Who knows what religious susceptibilities are? Would anyone here who is religious define their religious beliefs in terms of their own susceptibilities to some sort of teaching? It suggests that Christians have some sort of natural delicate condition like eggshell skull that requires special protection. Other people, religious freedom academics, lawyers and lobby groups have sat by for 35 years while this has sat in an exemption in a piece of law and done nothing. The rainbow lobby, the queer activists, have not been inactive. What is the name of this act? It's the Sex Discrimination Act. 
When we read the purpose, what did you notice? This is an act that now extends far beyond sex, beyond discrimination against someone on the basis of them being biologically a man or biologically a woman. It now extends to a whole other range of categories of protected attributes because there has been a group, there have been the queer activists who have had an agenda to slowly push that agenda through this act over time. The other major detriment to this approach is that we have a positive right to religious freedom, but it is framed in this act as an exemption. There is no place in statute where Christian freedoms are positively stated as being protected. This is the provision that we need to rely on, and already you are a loser because the debate is framed there are attributes where the highest principle is we must not discriminate. And somehow Christians are being given a free ride through exemptions to not obey a law that everyone else is subject to. It gives the impression of special treatment. And we've all been happy with it for 35 years. Let's have a look at what the Penny Wong Bill tried to impose pre-Christmas. So, the Fuhrer were concerned about these gay children, this cruel and terrible exemption that Christians are given at law. So we have this Section 37 exemption that we've just talked about. Penny Wong proposed to include an additional section, which we have there in Section 37.3, which says... We're going to strip away that exemption when it comes to the admission of students or the uh, practice connected with the provision of any education in a school. Section 38 used to say that you were exempt from the discrimination law in relation to any provision of education. We're going to completely remove the section that provides for that in section 38.3. So it's a fairly simple amendment that removed the extent of that exemption. Everyone excited to be looking directly at the raw law that we get our hands in as lawyers every day? I can feel the excitement. It's palpable. <laughs> what does that mean? What it means is that we've had the grand switch. The bait was, we don't want to expel gay students. It's deplorable, it's unacceptable. We live in 2018 Australia. But this is the switch. Christian schools lose a shield. Simply removing the exemption doesn't tell us much unless we go back and look at the original provision that is now aimed at Christian schools fairly and squarely should the protection be removed. Remember the, the issue, admission, expulsion of gay students. And this is what you would expect if that was your real concern. In the section that prohibits discrimination, you would think that they would only remove, only uh, uh, make apply these two narrow provisions that are in red which provides you cannot refuse admission to a person to the, to the school and, in 2B, you cannot expel that student. But that's not what this change brought about. It means you're subject to everything in Section 21. Now, we read a little bit about that and what it implies for Christian schools. It's not just about admission and expulsion anymore. It's about the terms on which you provide that education and making sure that the terms that you give to any student is exactly the same no matter who they are. That means that a school who would try to insist that a biological male wears a male uniform despite the fact that they experience gender dysphoria and want to wear a female uniform couldn't impose it. That would be a difference in the way that they treat someone on the basis of gender orientation. It would mean that if you do not allow a person to use a bathroom 
of their proposed gender, despite the fact that their biological truth is different than that gender, you could not do that as a school. It no longer becomes about the protection of students from expulsion or stopping them from not being admitted. It means that now your whole school is a hotbed for activism. The mind boggles. Not only was this bill proposed bad, there were parties that wanted to up the ante. So there was a Greens Party bill which pro proposed not only to remove the protection in relation to students, but also in relation to the hiring and firing of staff. So that meant that Janet Rice, who is a Green Senator, put in this bill for uh, consideration that completely removed all exemptions for every single educational institution. So we have the bills on the table for consideration. We have parties turning up to uh, make submissions. And as you would expect, the committee was swamped with activist submissions, which reinforced this message. It's all about discrimination. It's about protecting vulnerable people. Individual Tasmanian submission, for example, said, I know some people say that the ethos of faith-based schools should be protected. My response is that the law should uphold that ethos only if that ethos is fairness, acceptance, diversity, and inclusion. Then we have the submission from Equality Australia. All schools, same rules. For equality, we need the same rules for all schools. No student should be expelled or disciplined because of an inherent part of their identity. No child should have to live in fear of being mistreated and casted out of an educational institution where they have spent years learning and developing close personal friendships. The National LGBTI Health Alliance, the Alliance has long advocated for reducing discrimination, stigma and violence against LGBT people. Transgender Victoria, we believe that it is absolutely vital that transgender people are supported to be themselves and blockages to being themselves are completely eradicated. A person cannot have rights and freedoms when they are dead. So you see there is a barrage of submissions being made to the Senate inquiry that are dramatic, a complete overreaction, they try to own the language, and they, it is an overreaction to a law where there is no single example of any of the conduct that they're seeking to prevent ever having happened in a Christian school. So there were many appearances before the Senate in the Brisbane and Sydney hearings in early, uh, earlier this year. I want to draw your attention to one because it's cogent. Australian Human Rights Commission, who now has this issue on their table to consider. Uh, the Human Rights Commissioner, Ed Santow, presented before the Senate committee, and he was absolutely in favour of this bill. He said, we've been trying to get rid of these uh, exemptions since 1992, 25 years. Ed Santow is ostensibly not just the Human Rights Commissioner for LGBT rights, he's also your Commissioner for Religious Freedom Rights. But he says, we also note that there is strong community support and indeed political support for this reform. And so we do see that this reform is important and urgent. Then he said when asked, well, what about religious rights? Here's his succinct formulation of what religious rights are. Coming across someone with a different background is generally a real positive, but it can also present newness, which can be challenging. We accept that, but broadly speaking, I don't think that there is a human right that is specifically engaged by someone who says that they feel uncomfortable in the company of someone who is to them motivated by different things. This is hardly showing expertise about the doctrines, beliefs and tenets of Orthodox Christianity, indeed all of the major faith traditions, 
that have been held for thousands of years. It was somewhat of a, a casual dismissal of the religious position. Interestingly, there was not much in the submissions that challenged the fundamental identity narrative, the stigma narrative, or the appeal to it, acceptance, diversion, and ooh, diversity and inclusion. Two or three minutes, okay, I'm going to have to start pushing my way through this because we need to get to some lessons from this. So the flaws is that this was clear overreach by the government. It extended far beyond just admission and expulsion. It was flawed amendments to a flawed act. Christians have been satisfied with exemptions for years, but already from 1984, your rights were below anti-discrimination rights and no one has been actively campaigning against it. It was a knee-jerk and rushed reaction to an illusory problem. No one was getting uh, expelled from schools, and this was very fast before Christmas and tried to be rushed through. And it was out of step with international covenants. We have talked about Article 18 of the International uh, Covenant for the uh, Protection of Civil, uh, Civil and Political Rights. International Covenant for the Civil Political Rights. I always get that one wrong. ICCPR. So, what can we learn? Number one, conservatives always lose. If your sole aim is to conserve, you will lose because you have a progressive agenda against you and they continually slice the salami until there is nothing left. They've had a radical agenda for 35 years on this act and we've had nothing. We've been pleased to sit there protected in our religious susceptibilities. That needs to change. We need to learn from the queer activists and use their playbook. Culture leads law. Look at the language that's used. You can't pass laws if the culture is fundamentally wired to talk about primary virtues of tolerance, inclusion, acceptance. You will always lose no matter how good the legislation. Orthodox Christian doctrines and beliefs are not understood, and that's our fault. That's your fault. If you're a minister and you've never preached on identity, on the, the classic beliefs of, and Christian doctrines and tenets, you're the last guys who are going to be attacked. Get out there. Start to preach about it. Talk about what the Bible says. It's compelling. It's defensible. And it makes sense. And it's not just good for the people sitting in your pews. It's good for everybody. And no one understands it. Okay? Last... Activists do not compromise. We, this bill was defeated uh, earlier this year, but it's now with the Australian Human Rights Commission. And it's going to be the subject of more submissions and there's going to be a proposal put back to government mid-year. Make sure that you make a submission that you get involved. Remem remember who controls the institutions. I just want to read a couple of quotes from Justice Dyson Hayden, who's a former... Uh, justice of the High Court. He says, like most of the legal profession, most modern Australian judges, in their self-perceived sophistication and cultivation, have no knowledge of or respect for religion. Some of them detest religion. Their mental view, like that of the rest of the profession, is like that of the Italian left around 1910. Like the Italian left, they spend most of the day in coffee shops or bars, or worse, grumbling about the status quo. That's who we're dealing with. We need to change the conversation and be active in putting forward a coherent and cogent view of what our orthodox tenets' beliefs as Christians are. And this is what Hayden says further on in his paper on religious freedom. He says, The vigour with which social forces favour freedom of religion ultimately depends on two things. One is the vigour with which adherents to religion exercise their freedoms of belief, worship and teaching. Oftentimes we have been shivers without a spine in the public square and that has to change. The other is the vigour with which they meet their governmental and social foes in debate. Indifference may be a greater foe than persecution. For persecution can stimulate resistance, and resistance can develop strength. So I hope that those words are inspiring to you. 
I'd like to finish, if I have time, with the words of Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his, against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in heaven laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, John, for your um, presentation. Much appreciated in the challenge. Um, our next presenter is uh, Rocco, now I'm not sure I can say this right, Loyakono, good, Senior Lecturer at Curtin Law School. And <clears throat> he's a Senior Lecturer at Curtin University Law School in the Property Law and Advanced Legal Research Units and in the MA Translation Studies course of the University of Western Australia. He has an LLB and a diploma in modern languages, first class honours from UWA. He practised as a lawyer for 10 years, most of the time at Clayton Utz, one of Australia's largest law firms. Rocker was awarded his PhD from UWA in 2014. His particular research interest is the translation difficulties arising from the differences that exist between continental legal systems and the English common law. He's published in peer-reviewed journals of translation, linguistics and law, and in 2016 published his monograph, The Translation of Proper Names in Legal Translation, a study of translation of the bilateral agreements between Australia and Italy. Rocco's language competencies are English and Italian, he's a native Italian speaker, and French, intermediate. Rocco is a National Accreditation Authority for Interpreters and Translators, Certified Translator Italian to English, as the current National President of the Australian Institute of Interpreters and Translators. Ladies and gentlemen, please make welcome Rocco. 